All right. All right, everyone. Welcome to our two o'clock panel. We see every all the participants are starting to join here. So I'm just going to um, start with myself and I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Julie Baker. I'm executive director of Californians for the Arts. Um, I want to thank these fantastic, prominent California legislative arts champions for joining us today um, as part of Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month for the remarks and conversation around why arts are essential to California and in their own communities and how we as arts advocates can most effectively raise our voices for sustaining arts, culture, and creativity in California. Some of our panelists are only able to stay for about half the call as they have an, another important meeting to attend. We greatly appreciate all panelists for taking the time today on our first virtual arts advocacy day. So we're all, we're all figuring out this new virtual world to be with us and with advocates from across the state who are tuning in. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Julie Baker. I am the Executive Director of Californians for the Arts. Last year at this time, we met on the steps of the Capitol in Sacramento on a bright sunny morning, much like today. Senator Allen and Mayor Steinberg kicked off the day as we declared it Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month. We know we will meet there again because of the steps the Newsom administration and our legislators are taking to ensure our state and our residents are safe. We are grateful to all of you for the leadership in these most unprecedented and challenging of times. We are here today to highlight though why arts are essential to California and how also we must all adapt to a new landscape of first sheltering at home, then likely a period of social distancing until a vaccine is available. We know that the arts in many communities were the first to shut down and maybe some of the largest last to reopen to full capacity. We also know through surveys that across the US, the loss in the arts has been over four and a half billion and that through consistent advocacy, arts were included to the tune of about 300 million in the CARES Act through direct funding to the other, the NEA and other federal arts agencies. In California, our estimated loss is anywhere between 176 million and a billion. It's huge. And this is just with being shut down without earned revenue for about six weeks for the arts. We also know the essential role artists and creatives are playing during the pandemic to provide hope, inspiration, wellness, distraction, art, arts lessons for students and parents, and healing through online platforms of original content. And when we beat the pandemic and we return to our downtowns, arts will be what brings us back together and help rebuild and revitalize our economy. And with 15.4% of all jobs in California being in the creative industries, generating 650.3 billion in annual output per year, we like to say artists are our second responders and their work is essential and necessary. So today, um, it looks like we are missing one of our prominent arts champions um, right now which is the speaker of the assembly, um, Anthony Rendon. So we are going to go ahead and get started with the majority leader, Ian Calderon. So I'd like to introduce him um, and so uh, give you a little bit of background on uh, Ian Calderon. Majority leader Ian Calderon was elected in November of 2012 to represent California's 57th assembly district, becoming the first millennial elected to the state legislature. A product of the 57th district prior to his election to the assembly, Ian uh, worked as a field representative for the legislature, which allowed him to assist residents in his community to navigate state and local government. In March 2016, Ian became the youngest majority leader in the history of the state of California. As majority leader, Ian has led the assembly to pass landmark legislation, such as raising the minimum wage to $15 per hour by 2022 and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. He's particularly proud of legislation he authored that allows terminally ill Californians to ex attempt experimental treatments to try to save their own lives. Majority Leader Calderon currently serves as the chair of the Select Committee on Technological Advances, co-chair of the Legislative Technology and Innovation Caucus, and co-chair of the Legislative Millennial Caucus. He is a member of the Insurance, Communi Insurance Communi Committee, <laughs> Appropriations Committee, Accountability and Administrative Review Committee, Privacy and Consumer Protection Committee, and the Elections and Redistricting Committee. In recognition of his work to foster innovation in California, Majority Leader, Leader Ian Calderon was named Legislator of the Year by TechNet, received the Internet Champion Award from the Internet Association, and was named Tech America's 2014 California Tech Champion, as well as the 2016 
CompTIA California Tech Champion, a staunch supporter of arts education, Ian received the California Association of Museums 2015 President's Award and was named a Legislative Arts Champion by Californians for the Arts. So I just, uh, first of all, you should know how to use this technology. You are clearly the tech person, right? So Yeah, I mean, actually, this is, this is my first Zoom. I haven't, I haven't done one yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit of a, I'm in a little bit of a bubble right now because uh, we now have three kids under three. My third child was born on the 26th, so we have our two girls and a boy. Now wow. and it's chaos. It, it's chaos. I just want you to know this looks clear because all of the shit is up here. Uh, <laughs> it's dirty. Um. <laughs> well, well, congratulations on your third child and and for surviving at home um, through all of this. I, I can only imagine with three kids under three how challenging that must be. Well, we wanted to um, get into sort of, you know, some of the topics that I mentioned when I was uh, in my intro, but what, if you could just talk to us a little bit about why you believe arts are essential to your district and to the state overall. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I was elected in 2012, uh, Speaker John Press at the time had uh, graced me with the opportunity to be the chair of the Committee on Arts, Entertainment, Sports, Tourism, and Internet Media. Um, uh, for a lot of different reasons, but a big reason as to why I actually had wanted to serve in that position was because of uh, arts education in California, uh, arts funding uh, specifically from the state of California. And I, you know, when I had come in, I think all of the uh, collective funding for arts uh, in California was around $5 million. The state did a million dollars, the federal government did a million dollar match, uh, and then from license plates and other stuff, we, we got to around $5 million. And so it became really obvious to me uh, that this is a huge problem for our state moving forward. We are very much a creative economy. Billions of dollars a year that we turn around and spend on uh, public infrastructure or that we turn around and spend on education, um, social safety net programs, all programs that are important to us that we fund uh, and that provide a lot of good. Uh, come from funds generated from the creative economy. Uh, and it just struck me that we were making such a small investment on what was clearly going to be so important moving on and moving forward uh, for our state and our economy. And so I worked really hard uh, with the members of the committee and other members in the legislature, Senator Allen, uh, to try to uh, significantly increase the amount of state investment. Um, uh, in arts education, arts funding in California, which I feel like we've done, we're not quite there, but we've, we've certainly uh, bumped up what we have, uh, what we were spending from then to, until uh, now. So um, it, it was important to me for, for, for those reasons. I know that I had a lot of uh, opportunities that were afforded to me when I was in school, um, not just actual arts classes, but when it comes to band, orchestra, dance, all these types of things that I thought were extremely important and very uh, key in terms of creating who I am as a person. I'm not, I'm a creative person, not artistically. My wife is very artistic. She's a fashion designer. She's an artist. Uh, she's amazing at what she does. One of the things I love most about her is her creativity. I can't draw a stick figure that even looks decent, uh, but she's amazing at what she does. And it's, and it's encouraging to me that, you know, my children are going to hopefully, at least one of them will get her talents in the artistic creative space. Uh, but I, I pride myself on being creative in other ways, and, and especially when it comes to uh, this work and the job that I have right now. Um, but I just, I just thought we were shooting ourselves in the foot because there was just this lack of investment that we were making in our future when it, came to, when it comes to arts in California and how important that was going to be long term for us. And so I spent a lot of time not just working on policies uh, for arts and uh, arts education in California, but also when it comes to advocacy. I had you guys, a lot of groups that would come to me and I would give my best advice and try to be as supportive as I possibly could. Uh, it's important to me uh, in my district, I have a couple of schools that are specifically, they, they, they categorize themselves as, as, as arts schools and, and the school districts actually give them specific dollars for arts uh, projects. I go out and find different grants uh, to whether it's $5,000 here and there to buy instruments or anything else. I've done a lot of that over the last uh, eight years in my district because of the need. The need is very high and the, the, the importance and value that I see in those types of revenues being 
um, you know, coming from the outside and, and my position to bring those types of resources and revenues uh, to my district. You know, we have different arts, arts walks and, and festivals in you know, the city of Santa Fe Springs and city of Whittier, the city of La Puente, and, and it brings communities together. Um, you know, I, I think since I've been in office, I mean, notwithstanding our current circumstances, because we can't gather, we can't be around each other, uh, but it was just so important, especially in some of the communities that I represent, uh, like the areas of La Puente, uh, the city of La Puente, it's the poorest community in the San Gabriel Valley. These are types of communities where you can see gang activity uh, start to spike. And when you have arts programs, arts fest, arts walks, it brings the community together and it really helps uh, manage, manage and mitigate those other, other issues, um, especially when it comes to uh, gang activity, because you, know, you show solidarity, you're out together, and uh, that adds a lot of value to the communities that you're in. Um, and so uh, arts has just always been so important to me because uh, not only do I believe I was significantly impacted by the arts programs that I got to have when I was younger, uh, but I just see the value moving forward. And I also want my kids, all, of, all three of whom are under three now, um, and my two-year-old was supposed to start school in the fall. I don't know if that's gonna happen uh, now. Uh, we'll have to push that maybe back to next year. Uh, but I want them to have the opportunities that I did uh, because you just never know. And, you know, you want kids, especially in today's economy uh, and, and the competitiveness of it, not just being that you're competing against your classmates, but from kids around the world, you want them to have the ability to think outside the box. I mean, think of all these technological advances and, and technologies that we have. We wouldn't have that if you didn't have the creativity of, of people that probably took arts classes while they were in school growing up to give them this ability to think outside the box and come up with, you know, something like Zoom or anything else house uh, that is making a significant impact not just on us culturally but us uh, 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 economically so um, I appreciate everything that you guys do um, and like I said I really limited kind of my involvement just due to my circumstances with having a newborn and luckily my my, my one-year-old is asleep right now and I hope she stays asleep um, <laughs> uh, which well, is allowed I, to be a part of this I worked hard to get her down um, and, and I know that you guys have uh, there was a couple of questions, and so I want I want to allow time for other members because I know we're, we're time to uh, to to give their statements, and answer questions, and hopefully I can stick around for a little bit to answer a couple of questions. But I'm really happy to be a part of this. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, until the my end of my tenure, I'm going to be as supportive of the arts as I possibly can. I think uh, that arts are extremely important, even given our current circumstances, and that. Uh, you have voices like myself, Senator Allen, Cam Lager, Ms. Cam Lager, and the, and the speaker. Oh, there he is. Yes. Uh, Hi. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, we, we don't allow, um, you know, arts, arts funding, arts programs that fall by the wayside, because I think they're going to be really important uh, moving forward, given our current circumstances. And it's certainly going to uh, dictate a lot of what happens in our future, uh, given our creative economy. So thank you. I appreciate the time. And uh, Happy to hear thank what you. everyone has to say. Well, Majority Leader Calderon, thank you for your leadership on this issue and um, and for uh, just preach. We we love what you just said. So you know, continue to be one of our champions. Thank you so much, and um, and for also being able to make the time when you've got three under three. I don't I don't even know how you do that. Um, so the speaker is here with us, Speaker Anthony Rendon. Thank you for joining us um, and uh, for making the time today. I know you've got um, some commitments quickly, so I want to get you um, uh, started here in terms of if you could address for us the the what is the diff what's happening right now in Sacramento specifically in terms of the budget um, and sort of what does it look like in terms of your schedule uh, for the legislature you could speak a little bit to sort of what is the climate and the landscape of what's happening there if you would and thank you so sure. much for being here. Uh, thank you I appreciate it and uh, it's good to good to see Ian Calderon I don't I haven't seen uh, many of my uh, fellow legislators in a while Ian uh, I just caught the end of Ian's um, uh, comments there, but it's, it should be noted that Ian um, was about four years ago, Ian really started the conversation in earnest around arts funding in our house. So he's a, a long time, long time champion of the arts. Um, I'm uh, in Sacramento. I, I haven't left. Uh, the members went home about four weeks ago. Uh, Sunday was uh, 
a month since I've been uh, back to the district. I'm from Southern California, so I've been up here for about a month, continuing to work from the Capitol, which is where I am right now, continuing to work from the Capitol on a daily basis. Um, the CHP officer who lets me in in the morning said that there are, on any given day, there's about 1,100 people uh, in the Capitol. Uh, there's about five uh, this uh, every day in the, uh, over the past three weeks have been uh, approximately five people in the office, uh, three of whom are in my office. I'm not sure who the other two folks are. Um, so things are things are lonely here, but we're doing we're doing a lot of good work around uh, relief efforts uh, in particular. With respect to our budget and and the schedule, we the pro tem uh, and I pro tem uh, Tony Atkins, the head of head of the Senate. Uh, are, are looking for a May 4th return date, which is a Monday. Um, we're obviously going to continue to consult local health officials here in, in Sacramento, local public health officials here in Sacramento. When I say that, I think it's important to kind of think, of, it's important to keep in mind that that means something a little different than the way it normally looks. Um, when you, again, when you come to the Capitol, uh, there are generally, you know, something like 1,100 people in the Capitol on a daily basis. We're not going to return in that manner at all. Um, we're probably going to ask uh, every member to have maybe one or two uh, quote unquote essential staff members that, that they will designate as an essential staff member. So you won't have the heavy um, uh, amount of staff in the building that you, uh, that you have in the past. Um, also, we're going to sort of stagger our meetings uh, so that we don't have the same sort of foot traffic uh, that we have in the in the Capitol as well. So it'll be, you know, we want to come back on May 4th. The members are itching to come back to Sacramento. We have two budget oversight committee meetings, actually three now, I believe, uh, that have been scheduled over the next couple of weeks because the members are really itching to, to come back to Sacramento. It's been about a month since they've been away. Uh, so that's that handles the your your question about the schedule with respect to the budget. Um, we don't know. Uh, I'm not I'm not punting. Um, we really don't know. It's very difficult to figure out what our um, what our revenue projections are going to be. It's very difficult to figure out how much of our 21 billion dollar plus rainy day fund uh, we will have spent. Um, it's very difficult to figure out what sort of ongoing COVID related efforts we'll have to fund. Um, so we, we really don't know uh, what the budget will look like in terms of how the budget uh, process will take place. I think the best way to think about the, the budget process this year is to think about the way we normally do the budget, but to condense it. Um, I could imagine whereas we would normally have four or five um, budget hearings from a specific uh, budget uh, subcommittee, picture condensing that into one or two meetings, picture condensing a you know, multi-month uh, budget process into a couple of weeks uh, because we have lost, by the time we get back on May 4th, we will have lost almost two whole months of work. And those are our budget intensive uh, months. Those are the months where we're working the hardest on the budget because we do have to and we will meet our June deadline. Um, so, uh, so those are the, those are the two areas that, uh, that, that you asked me to talk about. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's helpful for those who are not inside, uh, the building as it were, uh, to hear, and we've got a lot of people interested in sort of what's happening for all of you. And, um, wanted to ask you though, specifically about the arts and, sure. um, you, you're an arts champion. You're someone we really, um, are grateful that you've always been in our corner. And I believe you're, you're serving on the joint committee on the arts along with Senator Allen now. And, um, I wanted to ask you why you believe arts are essential to California. You can speak also if you want to specifically to why you believe arts are essential to your own district, but if you could just uh, give us that. Yeah, I mean, the arts are a, a theme that sort of run uh, throughout my life. My first job out of college was at the Museum of Contemporary Art in, uh, in downtown Los Angeles. I run a, a, a huge arts festival in my district. Uh, on a daily basis, <laughs> I wish it were daily, uh, on an annual basis. Every July, we have a, a LA River Arts Festival. Um, just last night, I finished uh, a book that I've been reading called, uh, it's called Balancing Acts. It's about um, art and uh, 
uh, it's about art and philosophy in the in the 1930s. And I this morning I, I emailed a really good friend of mine, Marjorie Perloff. I'm not sure how many of your folks have heard of Marjorie. She taught at Stanford and at UCLA. She's a, 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 a poetry critic and um, writes a lot about Dadaism in particular. And I was we were emailing back and forth. Marjorie is 92 years old um, and um, I asked her if she was sheltering at home and she said, honey, where the hell else would I be? Um, and we were talking about, um, about the 1930s. I told her I had finished this book and she s sort of challenged me um, to, to think about the role that arts, the arts played uh, during that era, during that period, to think about things like, you know, uh, the, 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 the WPA and the writer's project that developed out of that. Think about the great, you know, the, the great Mexican mural movement, which preceded uh, our WPA project, but very much informed a lot of what happened, the, the sense of trying to build a, a national a, a, a consciousness. Um, and it's funny that, you know, that I talked to you today on the heels of that. Um, the arts um, give voice in a lot of instances to, to folks who don't have a voice in other, uh, other avenues, through other avenues. I represent a district, a very poor district. Uh, eight of my nine cities have poverty rates before COVID of 20% or more. Um, so um, what's interesting about putting together this, this arts festival is a couple of things have happened. First of all, we had the strong arts movement in our district, and it seemed as though a lot of these folks hadn't seen one another. Um, they didn't know that there was a, a performance artist didn't know that there was a poet, uh, you know, a, a across town, and and providing this sort of space for them allowed them to kind of make those, make those connections. But it also brought people from all over, at least Southern California, into the district, and 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 gave them uh, an, an opportunity to see a, a different part, and often an overlooked part of of uh, of Los Angeles. And I think uh, providing those linkages between one another both internally um, uh, within the district but also sort of on a regional basis is really is ultimately what the arts have been always been about for me the arts have always been about um, you know providing an opportunity for people to to have a voice uh, and to express their voice and I think um, that is n never more important than times such as these um, the fact that some of our greatest you know the when I was in graduate school, I studied a lot of uh, the European exiles who ended up in, in Southern California. Um, I spent a lot of time, you know, Christopher Isherwood and Theodore Adorno ended up in the U.S., uh, Rachmaninoff, uh, Schoenberg, Stravinsky. Um, all of those people left Europe at a brutal period, during a brutal period, uh, and came here mostly to California in those instances. Thomas Mann is another example, who came here um, because this, this place offered something uh, to them. And I think having that conversation uh, right now during, a, during the middle of a crisis, um, having that conversation with artists, I think you know, I, I recognize uh, the importance of the moment and I recognize that artists, I think more than anyone, uh, more than any group of people, uh, their voices need to be heard right now. That is uh, so wonderful. I hope everyone who's listening, um, you can't see all the folks who are listening in and, um, and uh, how uh, inspiring that is to know that the speaker of the assembly is so passionate, articulate, and knowledgeable about the arts. And so that's just really in, in many ways comforting, I think, to those of us who are arts advocates to know that. So thank you. Thank um, you. And I, I know that you need to go. Do you need to go right now or can I ask you one more question or do you need Let's to go? See. How do, I, how do I see the time on my phone? It's 2.30. Oh how about one question? Okay, so one question I would love to ask you, and I will get this to Senator Allen and Assemblymember Cam Lager as well, is as, what would you say to arts advocates right now in terms of what is the most effective way that we can speak to legislators, to the administration, in order to make sure that our voices are, are heard and that our funding uh, that we've all fought so hard for to get to this level continues within the scope of understanding what you're actually dealing with right now. But what would you say to us in terms of what is the best, most effective thing we could be doing? 
I think in the same in the same way that um, I in the same way that earlier I talked about the fact that artists in my district didn't know that one another existed. I discovered a lot about my district when we started doing this art festival. I think the uh, important thing that the, for folks in the arts uh, world to convey to elected officials is that artists are not somewhere else. Artists are in your district. Artists are next door to you. Artists uh, are in the same schools as your kids. They're in the same uh, community groups uh, as, as your whomever, as you. Um, so the, you know, the, the sort of basics of advocacy, I think, have always been um, uh, talking about, about making it local. In a, in a huge state like California, 400 million people, vast geographies, it's easy to get abstract. Um, but the easiest way of sort of making a connection with the legislator is to talk about the fact that, that, that their neighbor uh, is relevant in this discussion. It's, it's not abstract. It's about the person next door. It's about the person across the street from you. I love it. Thank you. I so appreciate you. your time. I know how busy you are. You all are. So appreciate all of your time. Thank you, Speaker Randon. And if you need Thanks. to go, you can just hit leave meeting. Hit and we'll, leave um, okay. it looks like uh, Majority Leader Calderon also had to go. Ben, you can't leave us yet. Or Senator Allen, excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, Bye, Ben. So, Bye. So I wanted to introduce our next arts champion, um, legislative arts champion, assembly member, Sydney Cam Camlogger. And she represents the 54th Assembly District in Los Angeles. I'm just going to quickly read your bio if that's all right. Um, born and raised in Chicago, Sydney moved to Los Angeles to attend the University of Southern California, where she earned a bachelor's degree in political science. She later earned her master's degree in arts management and public policy from Carnegie Mellon University in Pennsylvania. Sydney was exposed to politics while working with her grandmother to elect Harold Washington as the first African-American mayor in Chicago in 1983. In 1992, while studying at USC, the Los Angeles riots broke out. She was then motivated to work at Rebuild LA, a nonprofit formed to spur job creation efforts and restore the communities most affected by the riots. She also worked at the Los Angeles Festival using art to help the city heal. She spent the next 20 years working in many fields, including nonprofits, entertainment, education, and government. Prior to joining the state legislature, Sydney was president of the Los Angeles Community College District Board of Trustees and district director to California State Senator Holly J. Mitchell. Please welcome Assemblymember Sydney Kamlager. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. It's uh, not enough that we, uh, we don't spend enough time talking about the arts, so thank you. Right on, you're singing my song. <laughs> um, so um, let's just start with the first question that we've pretty much asked others and, and we've got more questions here. And, and Senator Allen too, if you want to kind of jump in, I know you, you uh, chomp in at the bit too. We don't have to be so formal because uh, it's now, now it's just us three chickens, right? So we can talk. So um, why, um, Assembly Member Cam, Cam Lager, why are the arts essential to your district and to the state overall? Why, why is that for you? What do you see that as? the reason so you know the arts are essential to our entire way of life um you know i love when the we have art a day without art comes around and you see just how integral the arts are in everything right how from how we design walkways and how we design parks to museums to film um to even how we design you know exercise equipment there is art and ingenuity and creativity and design, you know, in everything. And so I think it's really important to kind of stop separating the arts from how we live and to be more integrated. Um, because ultimately, during times of stress, isolation, anxiety, fear, panic, uh, we look to the arts, right, for the humanity, for the stillness, for the beauty, but also for, um, the education um, and the empathy that we need to help us understand the currency of our time and how to move through it. Um, you know, I have a, an amazing district. I love the 54th and we have great neighborhoods and pockets um, where art is really vibrant. You know, everything from the Kirk Douglas Theater in Culver City to the Lamert Park Village, 
um, to the Mamie Clayton Museum, to um, the Museum of Tolerance, to the Vendi Museum. Um, and those places are essential because they're gathering places. Um, you know, when, when crazy stuff happens, you find your space, you know, ultimately probably in a public park. Um, you find yourself close to a musician or a songstress or a dancer um, who's putting your pain and your confusion, you know, in dance. Um, you find your space, you find your way to a museum um, with an exhibition to help you understand what's happening. So that's why the arts are so important because when we don't have answers, somehow or another, the arts provide us either the pathway to those answers or an opportunity to reflect on what's happening so we can find the answers ourselves. And so what we have to do is to continue to remind artists of how um, critical a role they play, and then also to remind our colleagues who might not come from the art world about just how um, critical the arts are to how we teach, how we train, how we motivate, how many people we hire, um, and the revenues that we contribute through this amazing sector. So beautifully said, thank you. So appreciate that. Senator Allen, did you want to comment now? Um, and we'll kind of go back and forth in terms of a conversation around this, but why are the arts essential? I mean, you, you're, you're such a passionate leader about the arts and, I, and, and have done so much for the state of California in advancing the arts. And, and you were our arts champion um, last year, receiving the leadership award from Americans for the Arts for Public leadership in the arts and from us in 2017 and um, you're the joint committee chair and I have your whole bio here but I, I, I just want to I actually just want to hear you speak so let's get give you a chance to talk about why arts are essential. Well thanks Julie and, and it's just great to I, I'm sorry we're not all there together uh, for this wonderful annual celebration but um, but I'm glad we're doing it this way and it was great to hear the speaker and the majority leader in, in that. And my good friend Sydney, who in Sydney, I, I should just mention, Senator Kamlager has just been doing an amazing job serving as chair of our LA County delegation as well, and acting as a as a con, as a convener for lots of the tough conversations happening about our response in LA. So I just appreciate you a lot, Sydney. Um, look, I'm, I I I I can't. Uh, I I have to say I agree with everything that's been said. I'm I'm the son of a. My mom is a was a, is is a working artist, uh, works in ceramics and and is a is a painter. Uh, in oils, and uh, my father served uh, at, on the faculty at UCLA, uh, taught Shakespeare, other other forms of theater, uh, and so I, I guess it was imbued in me as a little kid uh, this this wonderful sense of the importance of creativity. Um, growing up in Los Angeles, but also having the chance to travel and spend time in some of those wonderful museums that we have, I, I loved to go as a kid to you know to the Getty Museum and to um, the the Page Museum and uh, the Natural History Museum and LACMA it was, it was part of, of my whole experience as a kid. And um, so all those things, of course, are, are important. And we, we know all the impact that the arts have on our economy, and particularly in Los Angeles with the incredible juggernaut that is the creative economy. But I also want to speak to something that I got to know about a little bit later in my life, um, serving on the school board, serving uh, in an education policy capacity. I used to teach education law and policy at UCLA at the law school. And one of the things we saw when I was serving on the school board in Santa Monica, and Santa Monica is a community, Santa Monica Malibu, a community with a lot of wealth, um, but also uh, some real disparity. And we had a lot of uh, you know, kids coming in to our district uh, who lived outside of the district. We also had a lot of kids who, who um, were actually coming from families that were really struggling. And the thing we saw consistently was that a strong arts education made such a difference for kids who um, may have had challenges connecting with the traditional curriculum that there's something about a good arts education that can really make the difference as to whether a kid drops out of school or not and um, you know you can sit someone into in, in a tutoring session and go over algebra equations till the cows come home uh, but if that kid doesn't feel as like as, as though as a school is, is connecting with them in any way uh, their, their, their likelihood of connecting with the more dry parts of the curriculum are, are not is not high and we found that, um, that arts classes can sometimes give a kid a sense of success and connection to the school experience that other classes simply can't. And when a kid actually is able to succeed in art class, when they may have been struggling in other classes, it says to them, hey, the problem is not with school. I can find a way to, to, to connect here. Um, you know, I shouldn't give up on this. 
I can be good at something. I can find a place for myself. Um, I, I can, I find my brain being connected to by, 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 by my school experience. And so I got to see what a, what a tangible impact a strong arts education had on some of our more vulnerable kids in our own school district. Uh, I then got to spend some time in the prisons, um, you know, in my capacity now as a, as a state senator, we of course oversee a massive incarceration system, sad to say. Uh, and, and one of the things that we've been looking at a lot at the arts committee is, is these really incredible arts and prisons programs where they, where, you know, you go into the prisons and you provide these um, folks with an opportunity to do spoken word and, you know, paint their faces and do a play or sing a song or just, you know, connect with each other. And, and your prison is such a dehumanizing place. And I don't know if how many of you have been in our, in our uh, correction system before, but man, you walk in there and you just feel the heaviness, the weight of what it all means and, and what, what the implications are. It's, it's not a happy place. It's not a happy system. And to have these arts heroes who are going in there into the prisons and working with our incarcerated folks, including incarcerated youth, and connecting with them through, uh, through a really robust and fun and creative arts curriculum, it really makes a difference in terms of whether um, you know, these, these folks continue to feel dehumanized. And we've actually seen an amazing impact in terms of recidivism and whether people will end up back in the system or not if they've been kind of treated like a real human being while they've been in the system. And so, um, you know, all that stuff is, is kind of real tangible, tangible things that I've seen, how the arts benefits my own community. I, I know how vibrant it, uh, a, a part of our life in Los Angeles it is, but also up and down the state and all over the world. There's something about the arts that connect to people in a different way. It's a, it's a, it's a different type of, 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 of brain connection that happens and, and heart connection that happens when we have a, a strong arts world. Uh, that's available for, for people, um, young and old alike. And so uh, we've seen it with veterans coming back from war. We've seen it uh, for, with all sorts of people. And so um, anyway, I, I've, I gotta say, I, I, I appreciate all my friends in the legislature who kind of get it. We need to make more of them. Uh, and I, and I, I have to say more than anything, I appreciate the advocates who have been out there day in and day out pushing us and making sure that the stories are told over and over and over again about the lives that are being changed through the really great arts programming uh, in every aspect of our society. So, so thank you guys for, for, you know, for keeping it up and, and never giving up on, on, on our creative community, on our artists, and on some of our most vulnerable people. Thank you. And thank you for, again, your eloquence and for being such a fantastic arts champion for, for the state of California and, um, and, and with arts ed as well. The programs that both of you are mentioning really require public funding. Many of them are being delivered by nonprofit arts organizations who then employ artists. Um, what would you say, I mean, you know, in our, our budget right now for the California Arts Council has certainly gotten larger than it was for 10 years, for many, many years, which was small, as uh, uh, Majority Leader Calderon mentioned. We're now at about 26 million in ongoing funds. Um, it's still less than a dollar per person per, per capita. And again, I mean, a lot of this conversation was sort of pre the crisis, right? And now we're in a different mode. But at the same time, our job as arts advocates is to make sure that we protect that funding, right? Yeah. Is, um, and so what would you say in terms of our best narrative, our best approach, particularly during these times, that you can advise us to what do legislators need to hear? You're already our champions. You get it. You know. There's others who may not have the same perspective. So how do we protect that funding that's so important to delivering the very programs that you're talking about? And I, I for both of you to respond. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say for my, for my own part, um, this is a really critical moment and it's kind of a scary moment in some respects because the economy is going into free fall. Uh, the numbers are not looking good. Um, I'm getting notes from people back home, um, uh, you know, from, from folks from different cities in my district that are just super stressed out about the impact this is going to have on our county budget, on our city budgets, and all sorts of good programs. And, and that, of course, often includes the cultural affairs uh, budgets of various cities. This is the kind of moment where it feels, it feels easier to cut the arts because um, when you've got a situation where it's like, you know, keeping the lights on at a at a homeless shelter or um, you know in in home uh, health service provider versus 
funding uh, an arts program, it, it, you know, it, it feels like this is a moment where we can kind of jettison the non-essentials, the arts, which is you know, how people sometimes think about the arts. And I, I think that would be such a mistake on, on so many levels. And I think one of the things that we have to do is remind people about the fact that this is a, that there are many aspects to this crisis, right? There's a, there's a logistics of getting masks out to people and getting food out to people and testing enough people and, and you know, enforcing the state home order and all those kinds of things are very important. Uh, but there's also, there's a, a serious psychological toll that's being taken. Um, we're see, and you're seeing that reflected in so many ways. You're seeing that with the increase in, in domestic violence. You're seeing that uh, with the kinds of calls that a lot of our counselors are starting to get. And it's interesting what, what people are turning to in a moment like this, where they are really having their lives constricted, what they're turning to for solace and healing are the arts. They're reading, they're watching a lot of the, the wonderful creative programming that's on everything from you know, Netflix to PBS. Uh, they're, they're, watching, they're, they're, they're going online to some of the museums that have opened up you know, virtual tours. Um, there, you know, people are providing art, great arts programming through our education departments for our kids. Th these are the kind of things that are sustaining people, that re you know, reminding them of their own humanity and their dignity. And, um, and, and when you look at, um, you know, there, there's, there are many, many um, previous examples of this. If you look at the fires last year and then the years before, we talk about artists, you know, obviously you know about the first responders. We know about our incredible first responders. In, in that case, it was the firefighters. In this case right now, it's our medical providers, right, who are, who are risking their lives in our hospitals and in our clinics. But the second responders in the fires, and I think it will happen here with COVID, are our artists. You know, the people who go into these communities in places like Paradise and up in, um, up in Sonoma and Lake County and Malibu and elsewhere, who provided a really open, invigorating cultural programming for the kids, for the, for the broader community, to help people express themselves, to help people heal. And uh, it had really, really discernible positive impact. And so I think there's gonna, we have to think about the fact that the arts can and have to play an essential part of our response to COVID. And I think we have to think creatively as we know how to do in this community about how uh, to, to, to demonstrate the sort of psychological benefit that an arts investment can have as the state emerges from this crisis. And I encourage you to be thinking creatively about how to frame our uh, set of priorities this year in that light. Thank you so much. Uh, and we actually have a social media graphic during Arts, Cultural and Creativity Month that talk about artists as our second responders. So I'll make sure to tag you and you can share that. In, in, I'll do it, I'm ready. Such a, such a believer. But yeah. Assembly Member um, Cam Logger, I'd, I'd love to give you an opportunity also to respond to this in terms of if public funding is necessary for these programs and we're going to see a shrink in our budget, um, what is the best thing that, you know, the, the hundreds of people that are listening right now can do to advocate um, to make sure that that funding is secured, uh, that we continue to see that, that emergency grants are available, that uh, what, whatever we can do to make sure that the arts can continue and, and, and deliver these programs. Right, so I think there are um, a number of grant opportunities that have now popped up. Um, I think there were $75 million um, in the, uh, for the NEA as part of the federal $2 trillion emergency stimulus. Counties are providing support. The LA County Department of Cultural Affairs created its Arts Emergency Relief Fund. Um, there are a number of other sort of small business relief programs that also are available to artists um, that are coming from the state. I have that information on my website. I know the uh, private sector entertainment industry has a direct uh, disaster relief fund yeah. uh, as it relates to COVID-19. So there are those opportunities. But um, to the question about state support, I think it's really important that we not compartmentalize the arts. Yeah. Um, it's not just about the person who's decided to put on um, you know, a, a folklorica outfit and dance. It's about the healing. It's about the story. It's about the connectivity. It's about the empathy. It's about sort of understanding uh, what diversity truly means. It's about how to actually be more productive, more thoughtful, and more humane and connected. And those are very real tangible examples of what the arts bring. But when we compartmentalize it, 
when we sort of push it off to the side and say, hey, we're just artists. We're not educators. We're not healers. We're not trainers. We're not entrepreneurs. We're not business folks. Then we actually are part of the problem of diminishing the value and the currency of the arts. You know, yeah. look at what's happened already. We've had to self-isolate and quarantine. And what did the governor do? The governor reached out to artists to say, hey, can you help create these videos to talk about in a funny way what it looks like to wash your hands, what it looks like to isolate. If you look at commercials that are happening, that are on television now, they are responding to COVID. How to um, live in your home and be with the people that live in your space and still connect um, to the outside world. We have always turned to artists to say, how do you help translate what is happening today into ways that help folks understand it, maybe help folks um, uh, consume and purchase, um, but help folks do what they're supposed to do. So we have an opportunity to talk about the importance of the arts in our criminal justice um, institutions, the importance of arts in our education facilities, what the arts mean to first responders like healthcare workers, like police officers, like firefighters. You know, what um, um, the arts means to human resource individuals who are on the front lines making sure that people are showing up every day and figuring out how to help them do their job better. What the arts mean to communities who are struggling with displacement and gentrification and all of these other social issues that are much easier to um, understand and appreciate using the arts. And so if advocates can do that, and help the rest of folks understand the story in a way that's creative, thoughtful, um, maybe uncomfortable, then that's where we find the biggest wins. You know, um, the Actors Gang in Culver City, they go into the prisons. They're just not doing theater in Culver City. The Unusual Suspects, they go into the probation camps, they go into the juvenile camps. They're helping folks understand um, or helping other people understand well, helping everyone understand each other. So when they're coming out, they have a better opportunity to not recidivate. And those, all of those things translates into dollars. If kids are dropping out of school, that's translating into lost revenue. If folks are going back into a system, that's translating into lost revenue. And so it's how we also sort of use the data um, and use what you, we are doing, because I'm going to include myself um, in the artist community, and how it translates into the economics and the health of the state. That's fantastic, and I love that. And I, I mean, I love the idea of not comp compartmentalizing, which in itself is a really difficult word to say, but, um, and, um, and everything both of you are saying, one of the challenges I think for advocates, and, and I'm bringing this up because I, again, you know, a lot of who I think is listening today are people who are maybe newer to advocacy as well and trying to understand like how, how do they find their voice. And I think a lot of times it's a little intimidating to, to speak to our elected officials or people feel intimidated to speak to our elected officials. So it's great actually. In the, the strangest part about all of this is to see everyone in more intimate spaces and to see um, you in, in or just the way you live. Um, yes, your unmade bed. And um, <laughs> I got the cat over here. <laughs> oh, hello, hello. There you go. So, and we, we actually had our lobbyists on a call earlier, and we we're sort of like demystifying who's a lobbyist. They're they're real people too. Um, and and most of them. And most, of them. <laughs> most of them. Ours is ours is. Yeah. But, um, one of the things that you know, and I, the speaker said this too, which is to to go local. Right. So talk to us about what is the best way for arts advocates to effectively tell their stories. Now, you've talked about the content of what's important. Right. But now how do we deliver that message so that elected officials act on it? You know, a lot of us write letters. Is that the best way to do it? Should we show up at your district offices? Should we make appointments? Like what is the most effective way for us to actually shift it from this concept of like, those who already know to a larger body knowing the impact of what the arts are doing and then translating that into investment and, um, and, and uh, support. So I think, you know, I think members love data. We love to see sort of district impact. You know, it's great when folks come and say, hey, we have this program and it's really helpful and it's helping LA, but I don't represent all of LA. I represent a portion of LA and I represent all of Culver City and a little of Inglewood. So what's the direct impact that it's having? 
on my constituency. Um, but we also want to know, so how, how is it helping um, the greater good, right? Because all of us are sitting on committees where we're looking at things from a state lens. And if we can come in with that information, it becomes very powerful um, to say, this is the benefit that it's providing both to me, probably to you and to the state. Um, I would say that if you can't talk to one of the members, don't think that talking to a staff person means that we're not getting the information. Oftentimes they have more time than we do to go to an event, to attend um, a session, to really get in the weeds um, and get down and dirty um, by making a visit. You know, we will have a very compressed amount of time to do that, but staff will come back and they will be raving and they will be sharing some kind of personal story. And you will say, well, I have faith in my staff person and my staff person is giving a thumbs up to this. So let me dig a little deeper and see how we can help. Many of us have access to, um, you know, small grant uh, pools of grant money and and so connecting with us to talk to us about you know how else to help and how to use this is also really important letters are great faxes are great other sort of creative ways of expressing um, need um, is also good but it's I think the most effective and I don't know what will happen in a post COVID era but reaching out to the offices and talking to the staff if you can't reach out to us and then learning a little bit about um, the member you know, if you know that Ben's comes from a family of artists, then you need to find the ceramicist who's in your um, advocacy coalition and, you know, maybe suggest that they reach out to Ben because he may be a little more interested in what you have to say given that. Or if you know that you have some groups that are working in schools, maybe that's the group that should talk to the senator. So it's also doing a little bit of homework to see what the triggers are. Uh, so that you can kind of go with a, a, a full ammunition uh, when you're talking to members. That's terrific. Thank you. And very much what we what we talked about in our webinar on Monday. So I'm glad to know we're on the right track. Um, Senator Allen, how would you? I mean, I think they were all, I, mean, I think Sydney hit the nail on the head. I, I mean, just to build on it a little bit, I, I think it's all, it's ultimately about relationship building, right? And, and um, uh, all the things that she mentioned are, are absolutely apropos. One thing I would add, I suppose, is just as you do have events or things that you're doing, obviously things have been changed a little bit with the COVID situation, do make sure to reach out to um, the, the legislator's office to invite you know, him or her to, to events in the district, um, to things that are happening. Um, I, I can't agree more about, about don't disregard the staff. The staff are absolutely vital to the decision-making process. Uh, the legislators are oftentimes running around like headless chicken working on, you know, in one morning you might be working on transportation, education, funding, um, you know, banking reform and insurance, and then there's an arts issue that comes up. And, and so you, you really do rely on your staff to give you uh, sound advice and the decisions that are made. And I will also say that, you know, staff end up acting as gatekeepers. And if, um, you know, let me put it this way, I've heard many situations where uh, someone treating a staffer rudely has led to, um, uh, uh, just making it a little harder uh, for them to, to get through to the, to, to the people they need to get through to. So I, I you know, I, that's, that, I, I, I just throw that out there for people to yeah. consider. Yeah. Um, but, but, but definitely, um, definitely a, you know, making sure that the, the legislative offices feel um, included uh, and, and, and invited. I mean, you know, get the staff and, you know, the, the local staff to come to the art openings and, you know, plays or, or whatever, whatever your organization is involved with, have them build familiarity with what you do uh, so that, that, you know, that there's already uh, a relationship there when, when key moments come up uh, where the legislator can act to help you. Thank you. I want to be respectful of both of your time and it is three o'clock, but I just want to end with this one question, which is we're doing a campaign right now, which is CA Arts Champion, California Arts Champion. We're highlighting people across the state that are delivering really impactful and important programs in their community and doing just what you're talking about in terms of um, affecting change and saving lives ultimately. And um, would love to know um, who is your California Arts Champion? Senator. I mean, I, you know, you, Julie, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I, obviously, I, I look, I love you guys. I think you guys have done an amazing job of pushing us. Um, obviously, you know, from a very personal perspective, it's my mom, right? I mean, she, she, um, she was a, a, the chair of our arts commission in my hometown, and I got to see uh, her take her, 
her creativity and her love for uh, for the arts into a public policy space, at least in our own local context. And that was that was really important for me uh, to see. And then I just I just love all the artists out there who are using their their work to to make important comments about the world. Um, and um, you know, I've I've been I've been watching some of the I mean, there's some fascinating films. You know, the, the Parasite is is one that comes to mind very recently. Uh, you know, some of the films that have been coming out of the, that Obama's been um, been uh, uh, producing. Uh, one most recently, there's one called Crip Camp, which talks about the disability yeah. rights community yeah. and and uh, there's a beautiful artistry that went behind the, the making of that documentary. Um, and then, you know, and then, and then people who've just been, just been great champions for, for social justice uh, through their arts work. And, you know, I, I think, I mean, that, that's everyone from like Charles White to Elton John to, you know, Diego Rivera to Joni Mitchell. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a, there's a lot of people I, I, I love and look up to and, and put smiles on my face when I think of their work. That's awesome. We're also doing a, a social uh, media messaging campaign, which is, you know, who's on your hashtag, who's on your walls, who's on your playlist, all that sort of stuff. So we're, we'll make sure that you guys get to play along. But uh, Assembly member Cam Lager, um, who's your California arts champion? Oh, wow. Too, too many to name. Um, so one of uh, my woman of the year is actually Felicia Leatherwood, who is an amazing um, artist. She actually does natural hair for African American women and she works on folks like Issa Rae and um, Beyonce. And so really sort of taking the crown act to the next dimension and talking about the beauty uh, and the intricacy that comes from African American hair and life. And so I count her as both my woman of the year and um, an arts champion. I think about women like Judy Baca, um, who really have made um, public art and murals so central to how we live in Los Angeles and to all of the young muralists out there who are putting up, you know, Kobe murals, right? That was our sort of disaster pre-COVID, um, helping us really sort of connect to a, a huge loss for both the city and, and so many folks who um, consider themselves fans, but the importance of, of public art and, you know, Kent Twitchell and just, wow, all those folks that you see that make you smile when you're on the freeway, now that you can get on the freeway and go fast. Um, and then I think of folks in my own family, my mom, um, who's an actress, Cheryl Lynn Bruce, and my stepdad, who is from uh, Los Angeles, Carrie James Marshall, who really sort of continue to push the envelope around theater um, and, and visual art and, and the stories that we generally really don't hear in their complete fullness. Um, and then I think of old school folks like Octavia Butler and James Baldwin, you know, artists who were eccentric and esoteric and thoughtful and cutting edge um, and spoke truth to power. And I find that I lean on all sorts of artists um, during, you know, times of crisis like this, when you just don't know how to interpret life, you either find yourself watching a movie um, or something on the screen um, learning a little bit about history or listening to music or going through your house and hopefully looking at the things that are on your wall that bring you um, beauty and allow you to reflect. Um, and so it's a very short list, you know, Catherine Opie, I mean, Mark Bradford, we have so many great art champions that are here in Los Angeles. You know, and I just want to say, I bet that it will be the artists community, the artists in the art community that help us figure out how to come back together. You know, I just believe that it will be you all who will lead the way to how we, you know, begin to socialize and how we figure out a new way to practice, I don't know, social distancing and social connection. Um, and so use that, you know, as a tool to help other industries, you know, kind of get some best practices from you all on how we will do this because it's going to be a, a, a shit show and we're going to need you all more than ever. Julie, Julie can I just, I, I do want to just throw in one thing and then I think all of us have to jump off, but, um, but on the call that I mentioned earlier that Sydney um, helped to organize, we were on the call with the, um, the chief public health officer, Dr. Ferrer in, in Los Angeles. And, and she actually brought up artists. Um, and I just throw this out there mm -hmm. as something that people have to spend some time thinking about. How do we reopen once yes. once we get a handle on this thing? How do we open reopen the creative uh, community? Um, and how do we do it in a way? You know, it's interesting. 
we're not just going to open and then everything's going to go back to normal. There's going to be a very slow reopening of the economy. And it's going to be those sectors that can demonstrate that they can safely reopen without dramatically contributing to, uh, to a resurgence in the, in the, in the virus. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, one of the challenges is that our cultural world is oftentimes very focused on getting a lot of people together in close spaces at a concert, at a theater, in an art gallery. And a basketball game. In a basketball game. And so, so, so one thing we all have to spend some time thinking about on the pra pragmatic side is, is, is thinking about how, how you can all build on your existing models in ways that um, will allow people to come together, but not in very tight quarters. That's gonna be something that will be looked at a lot uh, by the public health officers as they're thinking about who will be who will be reopening first and who will be uh, allowed to expand their operations in the post right. immediate crisis world. And I just want to throw that out there for people to be thinking about. Well, because we figured out how to go shopping and we figured out how to do laundry and we figured out how to do all of these sort of practical things that, um, you know, make up our daily life. But we haven't really, I mean, Zoom is great and Netflix is great, but that's not really what we're used to. And it isn't necessarily what humans want. Um, yeah. But so how the arts, how that reintegrates into our world, into the new normal is gonna be really critical because it's gonna be the first thing that people want when they bust out of their houses. Right. Nobody's gonna bust out of the house to go to Trader Joe's because you're already standing in line doing that. But you will yeah. be busting out of your house to figure out how to attend the next sort of Capoeira Festival or a, a how to go to see a film. And, and you all have an amazing opportunity to lead the way. I love it. I thank you so much for both of your leadership, your eloquence, your passion for the arts. It makes a huge difference. And I think for everybody who's been listening, it's also really, like I said, comforting for us to know that there are those champions in our legislature who really, really get it <laughs> and who are um, able to, to frame it in a way that I think is very helpful for us also in terms of our advocacy and being better and efficient advocates um, so that we can support your work to help us to move forward. And um, for sure, we, I think that interest of like, how do we reopen the economy? We know the role that the arts will play. It'll be challenging for us as well because of the, uh, the concepts around gathering. But you're right, we, we are the creative sector, right? We are the ones that know how to, um, when you're doing a festival, when you're doing a concert, when you're doing any of those things, some stuff always is coming up and we know how to roll with it. Theater production, all of us are stuff. So those types of people are going to come together and we're going to figure it out. So um, we thank you so much for your time. If you've got any remaining words that you want to add, please do. Otherwise, we so will. I know that Sydney, Sydney put her contact information up, us as well. Our offices are open virtually. We answer our calls. We answer our emails. We also know that a lot of people are hurting out there financially. And if you need some assistance with understanding um, the loan options that are out there for small businesses that may apply to you or unemployment related issues, uh, we know that's been a huge problem for people. And the system's been trying to dealing with a huge backlog and a lot of logistical challenges, but they've been working really hard to try to um, to, to get everyone's needs addressed. So uh, we're also available to help people uh, navigate some of the difficult uh, financial challenges that may be out there in terms of understanding options and, and, and opportunities that may be available for folks. And so we put both of our numbers up on the chat so people yeah. can call. Uh, That's terrific, you guys. Thank you so much for being accessible and um, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep up the great work for the arts and for the state of California. Thank, thank you guys. You. Thank you. you. Thank so you, much. everyone. Thank you. Come join us at five o'clock for happy hour. Oh, I love it. <laughs> we'll be jamming. <laughs>